I'm Richard Buse, greeting you for another edition of Book by Book. And we're doing the prophet Jonah way back in the Old Testament. And today we come to the sixth and last in our series as we come to Jonah and to chapter, well, it's really the last chapter, chapter four. Joining me are George Boer, who is, as you probably know, the founder and the director of Operation Mobilization for many years, and uh, Paul Blackham of London, who works with me there. And uh, what we'll do first of all, I think, friends, is to do some reading. And we'll look at chapter four of Jonah. We're joined here by these studio friends who come from Sandown, just nearby where we are, quite near London. And we'll start off with chapter four, where Jonah has preached, the people have repented en masse in Nineveh, the heathen city, and Jonah is not pleased. Let's read on. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Verse 5, Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well, should I not be concerned about that great city. Quite a reading. Now let's discuss it together, shall we, for a moment. George Verwer, may I come to you first? Given that Jonah was apparently the most successful evangelist in the Bible, why should he be so angry? Well, I think it's a tremendous study, and I've read quite a lot of different people's ideas, but I'm especially reminded of Elijah after he saw that tremendous demonstration of God's power on Mount Carmel. Um, then he, he goes out in the wilderness and says he wants to die. Yeah. Uh, one thing for sure, Jonah, our hero in this story, is, is very human. And he's got a lot of, um, I think we see very clearly he's dealing with a lot of anger. He definitely did not want to go here in the first place. He reminds me of the person that's sort of doing Christian ministry, but really doesn't have the right attitude and the right motivation. But he's doing it anyway, and God is merciful and using him in the midst of his, uh, even his wrong attitude. But it's, um, it's a challenging picture of God's working through an earthen vessel, and that should be a great encouragement to all of us who are so aware of our, our, our earthiness. This, you know, this treasure is in mm. a clay pot. Mm. And so I suppose it makes, it makes Jonah look in a slightly poor light, because if he had prophesied 40 days to be overthrown, uh, Nineveh would be overthrown, it makes him look like a little bit of a false prophet in his own eyes, as it hasn't actually come about like that. Um, that may be part of it. What's the lesson of the plant, by the way? Paul, the plant, the <laughs> well, vine. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a small uh, ending, isn't it, after the drama yeah. of what has just happened. And then you've got him, and then there's just this little plant grows up. But isn't it interesting, if we if he sort of examine Jonah's emotions, that gives you the comment on it all. Um, when it says, the Lord God provided vine, made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. So you think, actually, Jonah's just quite self-interested. The Ninevites, they hadn't done anything to him. They were Gentiles, so that's, probably that was enough. Forget them. They deserve everything they're getting. They were wicked. Their wickedness had come up before the Lord, like Sodom and Gomorrah had done. They deserve everything that's coming to them. What are they to me? Nothing but trouble. Forget them. But this little plant and just so soothes his own little head. Oh, I'm very happy about that, but I couldn't care less about the Ninevites. And it actually zoom. it really puts a magnifying glass over these attitudes, the bad attitudes mm. of Jonah. And that for him, as long as he's all right, as long as he's comforted, he's happy. But anyway, he doesn't care about others. It just, it kind of brings these things out even sharper mm. than they would normally, the fact that it's this plant. Yeah. 
George, can you elaborate a bit more on what the lesson was for Jonah? Well, one thing for sure, it's amazing that he seems to almost have forgotten what God already did in delivering him from mm -hmm. this, uh, this large fish. And I think this is one of the great challenges for the Lord's people today as we get so caught up in our day in trivia. And I think of my own marriage, 42 wonderful years, and some of the things I've inflicted on my dear wife because I get a bug in my bonnet about some little thing about the car or about uh, getting somewhere on time or something around the house. And it's just, it's a great message again that these great men and women of God we read about and in, even our modern day heroes, they're all human and they all fail. They all have their areas of weakness, but God works. God is sovereign and I think it's something that we need to remember and be quick to repent. I don't know if there's any indication. The book leaves us a bit up in the air whether he really repented of this and got sorted out. Later, isn't there another verse about where his ministry uh, yeah. Yeah. takes us? Yeah. yeah. We can look at that in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Let me come to your own passion, George, for just a moment. I mean, you've had Operation Mobilization. A lot of the Bible so much of the Bible is rubbed off onto your own spirit and onto your colleagues in OM, as it's called. Um, have you lost any of that in these last many years of OM? Well, I hope not, though I think we change, we grow. I think the, the biggest factor in the whole OM movement, and 100,000 people have been on OM, and we've given the Word of God face to face, excluding all the television things, we've given the Word of God to about one thousand million people, a billion people. But I think the strongest factor in this, of course, is Christ living in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. The second is very strong conviction that the Bible is God's Word. Uh, Jonah has been greatly attacked by liberals. I went to a liberal university before I left and went to Bible college, and they were specialists in tearing the Bible apart, ridiculing the Bible, saying it's all mythological. And so I, I could have during that time I actually lost my faith. A lot of my fellow students, pre-ministerial students, lost their faith. But I became more and more convinced as I read also books on archaeology and other helpful books that the Bible is God's Word. I remember Billy Graham saying, uh, I not only believe that the fish, I think he may have said whale, could follow Jonah, he believes, I believe in such a great God that Jonah could have swallowed the whale. Yeah. I, I never forget that. That was 40 years ago. And there are things that uh, we, we are surprised when we read, uh, and some may be surprised, some things about the book of Jonah, but God is bigger than all of this, and, and this is God's book. This is God's book, and we can trust it 100%. Mm. Yeah, I like what you say about Billy Graham, because your own faith started with his preaching in Madison Square Garden years back. Yeah. Well, first of all, the prayers of an elderly woman put me on her Holy Ghost hit list. She was converted to Christ through a gospel tract. Her life and her prayers led to my conversion, which took place at that Billy Graham meeting. Yeah, these That's things. God's chain of events. Oh, it's wonderful how we're part of a chain. These things bounce off from one to the other, and it's terrific. Hey, if Paul, if the book of Jonah, I mean, you were wondering what comes next, you know, mm -hmm. in his life. If they had had a chapter five of Jonah, Paul Blackham, where would we see Jonah next? Well, it was interesting. I was talking to a guy called Peter Nichols, I think. I think he's one of your colleagues. Director of OM in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. He's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just yesterday, we were on the train, and he said to me, what, what is chapter five of Jonah? And, if, and I said, well, there isn't one. You know, what comes next? And uh, he had the wonderful thought, which I loved, the idea that, of course, Jonah became the, uh, the first minister of a church plant in Nineveh with all these loads of new converts, <laughs> uh, just one minister for 120,000, which is probably one of the reasons why 100 years later it all gone. Um, <laughs> but possibly, that's a, that, whereas that's a great thought, that's a great thought. It might be better to remember 2 Kings 14, again, where... God's purpose, God has had a purpose for Jonah all the way along. Mm. He commissioned him to go to Nineveh. But actually, got a got another job for Jonah all the way along. Jonah knew nothing about this. He was off to Nineveh and thinking, oh, I hate this job, going to this. And But he's, he's dealt with, his heart's been broken, and he's been faced with these things. But we see that in 2 Kings 14, 
he, bring, he comforts Israel in its bitter sufferings with a message of comfort. Uh, and it, the, the, the bitter suffering of Israel at the time was so bad that when Elijah, Elisha, foresaw that, what the suffering that was coming, Elisha wept mm. about it. But Jonah is, is the prophet to comfort, and he did that, but he was the man to do it now after this book. Mm. He wouldn't have been able to do that before. Mm. So I think we should be optimistic about Jonah. He sat down, I think he sat down, uh, uh, he was sat on the ground, and the Lord gave him this uh, challenge from his own heart. Jonah, you need to be as compassionate as me. You need to have my evangelistic vision of the world. And I like to think Jonah dusted himself down, got up, and got back to so work. So he said, I'm yeah, not going to bother about it. plants anymore. I'm going to bother about people. And exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, I'd like to come to you just about last, really, George, as to what are the main lessons that we learn from the book of Jonah for us, for us Christians in the 21st century? Well, I think, firstly, we, we need to find God's will for our lives, and it can't be based just on our whim, our fancy, our fears, what we like or don't like. We need to get God's will, and, for, and sometimes that means a hard road in doing something that we don't particularly want to do. I mean, there's not many British people today that want to be missionaries to Tibet or Bhutan or the Maldives or the Muslim world. And so we actually have very few missionaries in many of these parts of the world, cities just like Nineveh. So to me, that's, this is a missionary book. Uh, and that's why they had it as the main feature at Urbana, that big student missions convention years ago. It's a missionary book. We're here in the Old Testament. It's quite amazing. Shows that God in the Old Testament was still concerned about other nations. We often hear, oh, he's only involved working with the Jewish people. God was concerned for the other nations. How much more today we must be concerned about all uh, the nations of the world. And, of course, another tremendous lesson is just God giving the second chance. Failure can be the back door to success. When I first came to Europe, I was only interested in Muslims, closed countries, and communist countries. So I was living in Spain, studying Russian, and I headed into the Soviet Union in the summer of 61. Total fiasco. I was arrested, accused of being a spy. They were going to give me all expenses paid vacation in, in Siberia. After two more days' interrogation, they decided I was a religious fanatic. Imagine that. <laughs> and so I got kicked out. I went, uh, that led me, that failure led me to a day of prayer where God gave me the name Operation Mobilization, increased the vision to bring Britain and Western Europe into my life, which became the most dominant thing in my life. And soon we had thousands of British and, and European young people heading out all over the world in the new Operation Mobilization, which wasn't just that narrow focus, but a much more global focus, which then led to the ships and, and a lot of other things. Mm. So failure can be the back door to success. Don't, let's not be afraid to fail. Let's be willing to take risks. Great lessons from a great little dynamic, mega motivating, challenging, uh, off the charts book. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I like some of your enthusiasm and your dedication of spirit to rub off onto us all and to rub off onto you as we close up because in a moment or two we'll pray. But first of all, let's think about your city, your own city. What are we doing for our cities? Uh, after all, one person can do a lot. May not do everything, but they can do something. And what they can do, they ought to do. And what they ought to do, by the grace of God, they will do. Think of the Marechal, Katie Booth, mm. the oldest daughter of General Booth of the Salvation Army. When she went to France, they called her the Marichal because mm. she was fearless. And they gave Great her a military book. title, tremendous woman. And uh, one day she was sitting in a train, and a man opposite had seen her in her meetings, dynamic meetings. And as though to tell her that he did his bit, he said, I go to church every week. She looked at him amazed. Is that all you do? You go to church for a dying world? Is that all? Mm. We have to ask ourselves the same questions, just as Jonah had to face it with God. So, George, thank you for joining Paul and me. Thank you very much for being our honoured guest. We love you very much, and we commend you to the prayers of all who are sharing in this programme. Very much. We will have a prayer right now. Let me be chaplain for us all. Mm. The universal gospel. God is the great evangelist. Help us to take this in, O Lord, from the book of Jonah, and help us to see its relevance for our cities today, for our lives now, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
So we'll, one, one of these days we'll be back again. Maybe, who knows, it could be the book of the prophet Nahum, but that comes 100 years later, all the best.